and his uh, assistant or his uh, co-presenter is Barry KD0RQU. Uh, Lauren will introduce uh, Barry a little later on. I think Barry's going to uh, jump in after Lauren starts. So tonight's presentation is about ham pie, and I'll let them take it away. Take care, guys. I'll be signing off soon. Hey, thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, so ham pie is uh, part of this presentation, and let me uh, share my screen here and see if we can figure out how to get it into uh, presentation mode. There, uh, that should be good. Can somebody give me a thumbs up that uh, they can see it? Good, great. Um, so um, I'm Lauren, uh, KE0HZ, and uh, Barry, as uh, Greg mentioned, will be uh, doing this. We're gonna split this because Barry has a good bit of uh, experience having been using uh, Raspberry Pi uh, for operating uh, purposes for a while. Uh, uh, he'll, he can tell you more about that. I am a relatively new one with uh, HamPy, uh, but uh, we'll uh, take you through, uh, through this. So what is shack in a pie? And we mean Raspberry Pi. Think about pretty much any application you might need to computerize your ham shack. So we're talking about things like rig controlled, uh, operating digital modes, software-defined radios, logging, satellite tracking, um, and in fact, uh, actual control of the radios. But it uh, also includes uh, tools, uh, calculators, and uh, educational stuff. And uh, we'll show you a few examples of those. One of the other neat things is we're talking about pretty small, compact. Uh, so this is something that you can take it into the field with you, operating soda or field day or other types of uh, um, activities outdoor. You can also, and it's very easy to operate the Pi remotely. I'm not going to uh, call it remote ops, but uh, but uh, we'll be showing you uh, that uh, the Raspberry Pi can be co-located with a radio someplace, and we can, from the convenience of a notepad or a laptop, we can be operating our, our radios uh, in the house or, or potentially remotely. There's hotspot capabilities. So if you... Um, lose internet connection, you still have the ability with a Wi-Fi connection out of the uh, Raspberry Pis uh, to do this. And probably uh, making it very, very approachable is that uh, we're talking about uh, quite inexpensive uh, to do this. So there's really a number of options. Uh, roll your own. Um, the res uh, the Raspberry Pi has a ton of support online that you can uh, go find. And uh, I had done some of this experimentation uh, earlier on with a couple of Raspberry Pis that I've had for a while and have uh, put various uh, applications on it. But uh, recently, and it got quite a bit of publicity in some of the uh, uh, some of the forums online and uh, a number of YouTube videos. Some of the uh, YouTubers uh, were interviewing a guy by the name of Dave Slaughter, W3DJS, who put together a compilation of a massive number of applications. And uh, at the end of the presentation, and this uh, the presentation will ultimately become kind of a reference for you if you're interested, uh, but we've got uh, a bunch of links and uh, lists of uh, capabilities uh, in the presentation that can be checked out later. But uh, Dave Slaughter has uh, the uh, code can be found on um, GitHub and downloaded relatively easy. The other area where uh, Barry will be talking more is an application or a, a, another compilation of applications called Buildapi. This was created by Jason Ullman, KM4ACK, who has quite an active YouTube uh, uh, site. And we'll explain some of the uh, differences. But what I'm going to say kind of going in is that HamPy is just a big compilation of a lot of things. The build pi doesn't have quite as many of these applications, but it seems to be a little bit more oriented toward 
uh, operating uh, with some of these applications being uh, integrated together. And that's going to be the uh, heart of uh, Barry's presentation a, a little bit later. So what's HamPy? I mentioned that it's uh, preloaded applications. It's based on a very, very stable uh, Raspbian uh, image file, essentially the operating system. It will run on a Raspberry Pi uh, 3 or 4, may run on a 2, but um, I don't think you'll be happy necessarily with some of the applications. And it is extremely simple to configure. Um, you, you uh, load the image, you put in an SD card, a few configuration uh, steps, and it, uh, it's essentially ready to go. Mentioned the Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. You need an SD card, 16 gigabytes or larger. Um, I would recommend 32. I'm going to show you using it on uh, 16, and uh, I have uh, run out of a bit of room for some of the applications. It's powered by a USB-C cable. Um, you need a keyboard, a mouse, and a monitor, temporary. And I'll explain that here. Uh, what's temporary about it here in just a moment? A uh, Wi-Fi or Ethernet uh, connection for uh, internet access uh, is very helpful. Um, we can do some things without it, but uh, obviously helpful. And then optional, um, when you start integrating it with uh, other equipment, an audio interface from your rig, which could be either analog or digital. Um, I'm using a digital uh, connection to my uh, Yezu. Uh, HF rig, uh, if it's an analog, uh, a signal link uh, for converting the audio, and then an SDR dongle, if, uh, if so inclined. So when I said temporary, keyboard, mouse, and display are helpful when you run the first setup, but with an application called PuTTY, you can run the Pi in command line from another computer on the network. In essence, what we're saying is the Pi is headless in this case. And we would use that to perform maintenance, uh, do upgrades, reboots, uh, monitor, monitor performance. Or with a uh, product or an application called VNC Viewer, you can control the Pi's desktop from virtually any computer anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. And uh, the uh, the demo that uh, we'll be showing you here in a little bit, both Barry and I are using VNC Viewer to actually uh, communicate with the, uh, with the Pi. And uh, there are links here uh, for that. This is what uh, PuTTY looks like. Um, I've got HamPy configured in here with an IP address. I hit uh, open it up and I'll, get, I'll show you what that uh, looks like. VNC Viewer. I've got a collection of uh, Raspberry Pis that I can view from uh, uh, from my network, or again, if I've registered it and uh, uh, connected to it via the internet. But this is all managed by VNC Connect. So in essence, VNC, our real VNC, is the uh, company that uh, provides this uh, for non-commercial use, uh, there is no cost, and they manage the things like the dynamic IP address that your internet provider may, uh, may uh, uh, require. So they have a means of uh, managing that so you can uh, stay connected and not have to uh, go through your uh, ISP. Um, we'll show you this in real time here in a moment, but here's uh, my HamPy uh, internet connection. And when I cl double click this, the VNC viewer opens up on an interactive uh, desktop. So my setup, uh, this is the Raspberry Pi that's running, uh, sitting on the uh, shelf directly in front of me. And as so it's the Raspberry Pi 4B. I've got an RTL SDR dongle uh, connected to it. You see a USB cable here. This is the CAT cable for the rig control that's connected to uh, the back of my uh, Yezu FTDX 3000. Um, I mentioned a signal link. Um, I do have an FT817 that doesn't have the audio card built into the rig, so I would use a signal link if I wanted to uh, uh, utilize uh, the, uh, the FT817. 
And note, uh, here's the USB-C connection. This is a little audio headset that I have uh, I connected up to listen to the uh, SDR. And uh, this is uh, the display that I'm actually uh, uh, have my presentation on uh, right now. The uh, monitor that um, I can connect to the Raspberry Pi is off to the side and outside of uh, this particular view. So how do you uh, how do you do uh, HamPy? Well, here is a SourceForge uh, site where the latest image of HamPy is located. Released in September of 2020, I think the uh, 1.0 version uh, came out last May, May June timeframe, up to 1.1 with a few bug fixes, and it's as simple as downloading the image uh, file that's uh, listed here. For those of you that haven't done this, uh, you load that image to an SD card. I happen to use a product called Etcher. Select the image. Um, the file that comes down from the SourceForge site is a .xz file. It needs to be unzipped uh, and then it becomes an ISO image file. And that's really important because when I upgraded from 1.1, I forgot that step. And about midway through after selecting the target and flashing, I get this, uh, your image is corrupted. Well, it wasn't. It was zipped. So um, that's, uh, that's an important step that can save you some time. You slide the SD card into the Raspberry Pi, power it on. And this is the screen that comes up after a couple of very simple uh, uh, setup screens. Things to, uh, for example, uh, set your uh, Wi-Fi uh, identification uh, URL um, and uh, password uh, so that it can uh, log in. You can use an Ethernet connection if, if you desire and hardwire it, but uh, uh, the Wi-Fi has been working, uh, working pretty well for me. So the applications, and I'm going to run through some of these. I'm going to not speak quite as much about operating it uh, um, with the radio. I'll show you how I'm using it uh, and how I plan to use it in the future. Um, when Barry gets into the, uh, the build a pie, uh, I think he's going to be talking a little bit more about uh, the specific uh, um, operating usage uh, for it. But these applications are kind of grouped into, I, I subgroup them into this operating modes where digital modes, uh, WSJTX, JSA call, uh, FL Digi, uh, which PSK, uh, um, the SDRs, as I mentioned, uh, ADSB, there's actually an application in here for tracking the uh, ADSB signals from uh, aircraft. Uh, Hamfax, DX clusters, Echolink, Winlink, APRS, and Slow Scan TV. I have not had a chance in the past two weeks to try all of these, but uh, uh, they're there. We have operating tools, uh, things to help you with satellite tracking, uh, digital uh, mobile radio uh, applications, rig control libraries, uh, FL Rig and HamLib, if you've uh, used any of them before, and Grid Tracker. There's Shack Management. Logging, clocks, uh, GPS tools, calculator and design tools. I'll give you some examples there. And then education, um, I, Morse code, uh, there's CW practice, but there's also some, uh, uh, some of the F FCC test questions uh, that you can uh, practice on uh, as well. So I'm going to kill this demo uh, here and uh, Let's see if we can, let's see how a demo works in uh, real time. So I've just opened up my VNC viewer. I'm going to double click on that. It opens up in my other, other screen here. And here is HamPy. And the first thing I'm going to show you is HamClock. Personally, I'm going to cover up the logo. I, I think we could do better than that, but... Um, um, it is what it is. I apologize that some of this uh, print may be kind of small. Um, 
I have to go in and rebuild the application in order to make this bigger. So I, I picked a size that I could keep it up on the screen. But I've found this um, in the short time I've been using it to be really useful and I keep it up uh, quite a lot. So I've personalized it uh, with my call sign. We have UTC time. Uh, it's got a built-in timer. This little clock here can be configured so I could build a countdown timer for 10 minutes and it'll give me a little alert that says, hey, it's time to identify myself. I've been talking too long and I need to uh, uh, meet my uh, FCC requirements and identify uh, my uh, call sign. This is kind of fun to watch because we're watching the uh, new solar cycle change. And this is the current solar flux uh, that the, uh, the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center and uh, some of the other uh, sites around the world are, are monitoring. And it's exciting to see this go up because uh, propagation has been improving here lately. VOCAP is a tool that helps identify propagation. Uh, so right now, I have a, my station here, the DE, is uh, my current uh, grid square. And I've got a buddy in uh, the London area that I'm interested in communicating with. So I click on it, and now I see the short path or the long path uh, connection. VOCAP will actually give me a prediction of at 100 watt CW, I have a 46% chance of being able to make this connection on 80 meters, a 63% chance at 40, and a 44% chance at 30. So this has uh, got an al algorithms in it that are looking at the uh, ionospheric conditions and we'll, uh, we'll make predictions like that. But we can change these screens. Here's the current uh, A geomagnetic index. Here's the current KP index. It's a pretty quiet uh, magnetic, uh, uh, geomagnetic uh, uh, situation right now. Here's a picture of the, uh, the current picture of the sun and there's a couple of other options um, for these screens the NOAA space weather predictions for RS and G. And I'm not gonna go into what all of those mean, but everything's green. So we're, have, we're not having space weather events at the, uh, at the moment. But I can also say, you know what, I'm, uh, it's daytime over in uh, Japan. If I move this, my short path now has uh, changed direction. And if we go back here to the, uh, I'm sorry, VOCAP. Now it's not uh, the uh, lower bands, but I've got a much better chance of making that connection on 20 meters or 17 meters uh, at this time. Interestingly, earlier today, I was seeing some very high probabilities on some of the uh, higher bands, uh, 15, 12, and 10, 10 meters, which is uh, a lot of fun to see. And then one other thing that's showing up on this screen is uh, satellites. Uh, so right now, AO92, this red, is, is in view. And let's look at the, uh, the map when it comes up. What happened? That's not quite right. AO73 here is rising in nine hours and 45 minutes. Uh, let me go back to uh, that and pick a satellite that actually is in view right now. Or here's one that uh, FO99 is gonna be up in one minute. And there you can see that we're just on the fringe of that satellite coming into view and it'll be, it'll be in view uh, for you know, about eight or nine minutes uh, as it passes. So it's a, a neat way to predict or see what, uh, what is actually happening out there. So the way that the uh, applications have been organized in this are the typical Raspbian uh, apps. We have, we have programming, we've got some education, we've got our office. So these are all open source equivalents of uh, 
I shouldn't say equivalents. Um, they they read uh, Microsoft Word documents, uh, uh, Access, uh, Excel, and I'm actually showing you in uh, LibreOffice Impress, which is uh, an equal, um, a PowerPoint application. Sound and video, graphics, games, system tools. But here's where all of the uh, HamPy applications are, are located. So Ham Radio, I mentioned some of the categories here. If I need to try and move my screen here. So antenna analyzers. I'm not, I know that some of the members of the club have used NEC uh, applications to do some modeling of the antennas they're building. We've got automatic packet reporting systems, APRS, and some tools that are required to, uh, to do that. I can't speak to that. Barry uh, might mention this a little bit in his. Here's a calculator, for example. We've been talking about the nano VNA uh, in uh, some past uh, presentations. And here's, uh, here is a Smith chart application. I uh, was just trying this out, thinking that uh, this would be kind of fun to, uh, to see how it worked. And without going into a whole lot of detail, just show you really quickly. This point represents 50 ohms. And we obviously want to match our 50 ohm outputs to uh, loads that have 50 ohms to minimize our SWR. I pl plugged in a center frequency of 14.2 megahertz with an impedance. Now, if you hooked up an MFJ uh, antenna analyzer and tuned it to 14.2, you might see a, an impedance represented at the end of your 50 ohm uh, coax of 150 ohms plus J35. So it's got a reactive component and it's, uh, three times higher in resistance than the uh, 50 ohms. You would, I'd like to lower my SWR, um, which is currently at this point 3.18. And I'd like to see if I couldn't find a way to match that antenna to my 50 ohm spot. I've got a whole bunch of 75 ohm cable TV coax laying around. And I thought, what? I was wondering what would happen if I put about a quarter wavelength, which would be 90 degrees, I've got 99 plugged in here of 75 ohm coax. And what it does is it brings the impedance over to about this point here. If I connected that directly to my 50 ohm load, you can see at the bottom on the right there, an SWR of 1.71. But I think I can do a little bit better than that. So I hooked, what if I hooked up a quarter wavelength of 50 ohm coax to it? I end up getting this. So I'm going to just uh, select that. And this is kind of interesting to watch. I'm going to reduce the length of this, of this coax in the tool here. And you see the number decreasing. So this is about 75 um, degrees, which would be less than a quarter wavelength. And, but right here, the SWR result is 1.43. Now, as I reduce, or I'm going to increase the length of it because it actually, that's not long enough to reach from the an antenna to my rig. So I'm just going to move it around to 413. So that's about a one and a quarter, actually one and a quarter wavelengths of uh, coax, which would be 20 meters plus another five meters, 25 meters. So uh, about 75 feet. And it ends up right there. And I've got a impedance of about 70 ohms, no reactive component and an SWR of 1.41. So I just wanted to show you this real quickly to show that you've got some tools that can, you can use to help you understand your new nano VNA, if that's a tool that you happen to in, 
uh, happen to buy, but even if you don't have one and are able to measure the t uh, impedance of an antenna, here's a, here's a neat tool that you can uh, utilize uh, for that. So not trying to uh, go too deep on this. Um, some of the other applications here. DRATs, this is uh, digital radio, some digital radio tools. I think this is a D star, uh, yeah, as it says, a D star communication tool. You're probably aware or have heard of FL Digi. If you've done any digital stuff with WSJTX, this is uh, a number of other, uh, a number of other uh, capabilities. And FL Rig is uh, using your CAT cable can control. Uh, it, it gives you a hands-free from your HF rig. And again, operating it remotely, you can change frequencies and operating modes. But I'm going to turn on FL Digi here for just, uh, just a second, just to show you the screen that comes up. I've got my radio tuned to 7080, uh, which is a packet radio um, frequency. And I'm operating here PSK 31, and I'm not seeing any signals. I was on 20 meters earlier today, and uh, there were all kinds of signals that were decoding. So there was something that came in that might have been noise, but uh, there are all kinds of op modes here. Uh, I've done a little bit with uh, MFSK and PSK. Um, meaning to try Olivia sometime, but uh, quite a bit of activity. And uh, there were a good number of foreign stations uh, that were operating uh, earlier today when I was, uh, was checking that out. But also related to the, um, uh, the FL Digi suite are, it's, is a, application called FL Cluster. And I've been monitoring this, uh, just getting reports all day. And the site that I was connected to um, were, uh, was uh, hearing reports of stations that I should have been able to uh, um, access or uh, uh, hear as well. So just randomly, I picked a few of these. It tells you what frequency. If they were uh, in sideband, I was uh, the sideband portion. I was able to hear a good number of them. Some of them are, you know, the operating mode that they're operating in, FT8. Um, it's pretty easy to tell if they're in the, uh, you know, if it's a CW, uh, a CW signal. But it's a really, really neat tool that gives you some insight into um, who's, who's operating. Let's uh, move on. Um, some of the uh, training um, things. Those of you that are learning Morse code, there's a tool called XCWP. And I can select here the types of uh, code I want to practice on. So let's look at English words. I want to do, let's say I'm up at about 18 words a minute. I start this and it starts randomly selecting words. And down here you can see, uh, hopefully you can see it, uh, this code, uh, what is being sent is changing at a pretty good rate. I can speed this up and these words come a good bit faster but good a uh, good way to practice and you can select a number of different uh, you can do character groups which is a which can be pretty difficult or um, i'm not sure if they do call signs or not but uh, good practice um, and very very simple to uh, simple to set up. Also in the training area is an FCC exam. So I want to, I want to select a pool from, um, I can 
select the pool that we're taking it from. We can select basic radio law. We can select the different sections. And I'm not sure. Well, it came up and it uh, asked me the last time I was into this if I wanted uh, the technician, the general, or the extra class group. And it randomly uh, selects questions. There are the multiple choice examples and tells you if you're right or wrong. And again, uh, good practice. So those of you that are uh, going to do the help session, um, something like this would be a, a great thing to, uh, to practice on. Uh, just uh, alternatively to uh, look uh, going through the book. Uh, Barry, uh, you probably uh, can uh, get re yourself ready because uh, we're about probably about five minutes from getting to yours. This is pretty cool. Um, I showed you the RTL dongo that I've got uh, connected up here. I'm going to turn on a a um, application called cubic SDR. So what I'll do here is select my SDR device, which is right here. We'll start that. And I'm going to set the center frequency to our, around the middle of our two meter band. Here's 147. And we've got a signal here around 147, 155. I'll switch that to narrow band. And now we can start to see signals. I found this really quite useful because my um, Yezu F that I used for a base station for uh, repeater access here is the FT817. And it, um, I don't, scan with it. So I don't really know where um, where things are happening. I can look with this across the uh, whole band and basically see when, oh, here, somebody just popped up. That might have been, you know, just a quick tone or somebody kerchunked over here on around 146.2. But you can start to see when the repeaters are active. Uh, Barry and I were doing an experiment yesterday of uh, what would happen if he keyed up the repeater. He was talking with uh, Steve, WG0AT. I was able to see distinctly when those guys were transmitting on 147.075. But interestingly, I couldn't see where they were transmitting. If I weren't in the hole that I'm in and had uh, line of sight communication to them, I'd have been able to see both the repeater and their transmission and show up on, um, on the SDR screen here. So um, I can do this because I'm in the basement of a Faraday cage with the uh, stuccoed house and the chicken wire around uh, most of me. Uh, but um, uh, I've got it connected to... Uh, uh, my VHF UHF antenna that I've got up on the roof of the house. So anyway, it's, um, it's a neat tool uh, just from uh, the standpoint of seeing who's active. And uh, that RTL dongle, uh, I think, was probably less than $25. Um, if you've got an SDR play, uh, that would work just fine uh, as well. Now, what's kind of interesting, um, I didn't talk about this at the beginning, uh, but I'll uh, show you something here. Why would you use a, uh, the putty uh, for, to bring up a terminal mode? This is uh, terminal mode for, the, uh, for this Raspberry Pi, and I'm going to run an application here called HTOP. And what it does is, it's showing me all four cores of the, S of the uh, Raspberry Pi, and they're pretty busy because they're running the uh, SDR. The SDR takes uh, a good bit of horsepower to run. I'm going to shut it down and just show you how the activity on the Raspberry Pi just kind of closed out. Neat tool to kind of 
decide, you know, do I have something running that's uh, causing everything to slow down? And uh, if you want to get a little bit uh, more geekier about uh, using the Pi and uh, learning some things about Linux, kind of a cool and uh, simple thing to uh, simple thing to do. So let me go back into the presentation here. I've got a couple of screen shares for uh, for these uh, applications that uh, just uh, that can be included in here. But what I'd like to do next is ask Barry to jump in because he's going to give you some insight into his use of the uh, build a pie. So. Uh, Barry, can you take it away? I'm going to stop my share for a while, and then I'll jump back in when you're uh, when you're all done. Those that don't know me, my name is Barry and KD0RQU, and I'll be talking about Build a Pie this evening. Uh, Build a Pie is uh, put out by KM4ACK uh, Jason Alderman. Uh, he's in Tennessee, and he's been quite active, and uh, he's been running, working on this. Uh, uh, this program for about two years now. So I've been following him during that time. So anyway, uh, so what is a, I need to move something. I can't, <laughs> can't see my presentation. Uh, what is build a pie? Build a pie is a collection of applications that are used in the field for emergency communications. Uh, therefore, uh, it's not as, you know, no internet required. And while in the field, you run it in a headless using the uh, Pi's hotspot or to your viewing device, not being tied to your radio with cables and I, uh, cables, etc., is ideal. And if Wi Fi is available, why Build a Pi can be used for those applications. And I don't know how to get rid of this. I can't see, I can't see my thing here. I'll try that. Uh, for those that the applications that require internet. Uh, because it's uh, used for emergency communications and is used with no internet uh, and in the field, a lot of the uh, applications that uh, Lauren was just showing you uh, is not required, so they're not put in. There are some things that are uh, put into the, in the uh, build that are uh, Wi-Fi related, I mean, you can use those or not. So. Uh, build a pie. What do you need? Same, basically the same thing that uh, that Lauren was talking about. Uh, an SD card, uh, 32 gig is, uh, is recommended. Uh, Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. I have both. Uh, I use uh, the the 4 for uh, operations out in the field. Again, the uh, keyboard, mouse, monitor, and um, uh, and monitor are used only during the initial load. After that, you'll be going headless, and you do not need those because you'll be using VNC. Uh, you need an internet connection during the initial load. You can do it with uh, Wi-Fi, but that is going to be slow. So again, you need an audio interface cable from your radio to your sound card, whatever you're using. I, mean, I use a, a signal link because my radio is a bit older, doesn't have the uh, digital outputs. And you're going to need a real-time clock, as FT8 and SJS8 require accurate time to run correctly. And uh, GPS, GPS dongle will also give you an accurate time as well, plus your GPS coordinates. So uh, let me see. So let's talk about Jason a little bit. Uh, the KM4 ACK website is very well maintained, and Jason puts out a new video and a newsletter about once a week. Sometimes he sneaks uh, another video in just if he got something going on. Um, he maintains a very active forum or a user group with a good following. And he's always looking for inputs for other hands, for programs to add. And he has a group of beta testers to help him with his latest build. And he's very responsive. You, if you send him an email, uh, he'll get back with you, like it, don't like it, or whatever. If you're having problems, you can go, you know, he, uh, I mean, he gets on the active forum. He uh, keeps in contact with a lot of people. And he, Jason also field tests his uh, Pi and reports his success and failures, especially for his failures. He's famous for that. Something comes up, and he'll let you know. 
So again, the PI is designed for the field portable use and the primary focus is on emergency comms. Um, Jason's call goals, okay, M4 ACK goals, is to provide a usable platform for digital modes in the field. We're gonna be using a PAT WinLink, which gives us HF and VHF email, APR, APPRS position reports and text messaging, and digital mode FLDigi, which uh, uh, Lauren just kind of talked about, JS at call, and ecoms uh, for ecoms, and FT8 for play. He has some other things in there that you that uh, for play that's related to uh, ham radio. And again, the statement uh, down at the bottom, he got involved with the ham radio uh, in 2009. Actually, I think it was 2010 or 11, because after he went through the uh, hurricane or tornado, he decided he wanted to become a ham radio operator, and he did so. And let me see. Okay, let's talk about the build a little bit. When you build the, uh, uh, build, the, build the Pi, you can select what software you want to install. Uh, you normally, during the first time you, you do this, you probably want to install basically everything, and then later on start uh, weeding out those programs that you do not use. Uh, during, install, you're, during the install, of the, uh, you supply some basic information. The build will configure most programs for you, and this is a big deal because it keeps you out of Linux. Jason's done a lot of work tying all kinds of programs together, uh, integrated, and it makes it uh, very nice to use while you're in the field. Uh, the sound card and radio will need to be configured, and the Jason puts out excellent videos uh, to walk through the process. He put, he's got a lot of videos on, online, and they're very interesting. Uh, okay, it'll take you about four hours to, uh, to load this thing, depending on the, uh, um, on the what type of model of Pi you have, the internet, uh, internet connection speed that you use and how many programs you can install. But you can start the download and just walk away from it and then you come back and be done. Uh, programs are easily updated. And uh, that's important because you don't have to go back and rebuild everything again. Uh, the Pi is uh, easily upgraded to different versions. Same thing, you don't have to go back and uh, reinstall the, the whole build again. And Villa Pi has an auto hotspot if the main Wi-Fi SSID is lost or not available. And again, the hotspot is used with VNC for portable use. And uh, Lauren kind of talked about, about uh, VNC. VNC really makes things cool because you can just uh, be on a, any kind of tablet, phone, or anything else. And you can have five different things uh, loaded up with the same program at the same time, different, different parts of the house you want to. You can <laughs> go from device, 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 if you have more than one device. Uh, this is my portable station. Uh, I'm using an FT. Uh, you can you can see what I'm using here, but um, leave that up for just a minute. And uh, the signal link is what I'm using for the audio, audio interface. And I'm using uh, the uh, uh, rig runner for power. And I got I got slots left over open if I want to uh, use them. And I've got like 30 hours over 30 hours of uh, uh, capabilities with this if I carry both batteries with me. So it's just, I have, just I'm not going to use 30 hours worth of, of power. Okay, so what is Winlink? Barry's going to talk about Winlink again. <laughs> and uh, I usually talk about Winlink. Everybody's probably tired of it by now. But Winlink has such a unique spot in the packet radio and the internet and emergency, com and emergency comms that you just about have to talk about it every time we talk about digital. But basically, it's a worldwide system for transferring email by radio. Uh, my, one of my definitions, one link is a software bridge that links packet radio to the internet. That uh, packet radio goes all the way back into the uh, 80s, 90s, and, uh, but it brings it, uh, it, was, it was used in BBS uh, systems and things of that nature, and that was pre-internet. And this particular piece of software links the, uh, the old stuff to the new stuff. So Pat Winlink is a... Uh, Raspberry Pi's version of WinLink into slim down version I used on the Pi. And Lauren, I did change the uh, slimed down to slim down, as you can see. Uh, you will need to register WinLink to use uh, 
Winlink or Pat Winlink. Uh, Pat Winlink is one of the main programs used on this build, so uh, registering is a must, and it's free. Okay, so some of the main news that many users we've got ham radio operators. Uh, we have emergency communications. We've got for local and state, national, and international. And different governments use it, not, on, not only our government, but uh, and it's used for auxiliary agencies so like Mars and uh, Department of Defense, etc. Also, it's used for maritime search and rescue. A lot of different agencies, you've got AARL, you've got Department of Defense, Red Cross, I'm sure, you know, just... Uh, this is just uh, got FEMA. This is just some of the people that use this. So it's a very widely used program throughout the world. Uh, so how did we use it? Uh, slowly hams. You always notice us the hams were way down here on the bottom of things. So the uh, we've got the ham. We've got some type of computer. In this case, it's a Pi. We have a radio. Radio transmits the uh, the email to a radio messenger server, which is uh, also known as RMS stations. And you can do this in HF or VHF. Uh, and they, in turn, put it on the internet. Uh, these are uh, Perth and Halifax. And this is an old slide, so they're no longer uh, serviceable. They changed over to Amazon. So the, there's a common messenger server. And I think that Amazon still has uh, five servers. And this, they are all mirrored, the, the exact same uh, information on all five so, uh, services so that the, they can download just about any place in the world. And that's a two-way thing. And if you have it, it comes back down the path, back down to your radio for to receiving email. Uh, RMS station, our local RMS station is KE0GB-10, Richard. Uh, he is down here in the springs. So he's, uh, uh, that's the only one I can get uh, in contact with. This is me here. So we're right in the middle of things between Denver and between Denver and the, the springs here. And so it's kind of a, kind of a, kind of a long haul between them. I can't make this with a HD, but I can make it with my main radio. Okay. Install process. Uh, again, more, more or less like, more or less like Jason, oh, not Jason, uh, Lawrence. Um, install, it's a, it's a two, but it's a two-part install. You download and flash Raspbian Buster to an SD card and run the setup. Uh, then I, you go to Jason's uh, Git, GitHub page and you'll find a video on the uh, install process. And that's basically one line of code that you, that you uh, uh, type into, uh, copy and paste and put into your uh, text on your uh, terminal. And it'll start running off by itself. On this same page, you also find a list of programs with a brief description that can of programs that can be installed. Okay. Whereas uh, Build a Pi configures a lot of stuff for you, there will be still still some configuration left to do. Uh, Jason puts out uh, excellent how-to videos, how to walk you through the process. So the install process is uh, a bit more uh, entailed than. Uh, uh, Build a, a, a build ham pie, uh, but uh, uh, it's not that difficult. If I can do it, just about anybody can. It's just, uh, it's just it just takes a, it takes a while to get it in there. Once uh, again, we're supplying you some links um, that you can use and everything. I just want to mention O H A S T N Julian. He's out of Finland. He's been running uh, the pie in the field for uh, for a long time. And he's got a very interesting site, very unique way of looking at ham radio. And uh, he, uh, he's a character, let's put it that way. And some, uh, some links to some of the uh, uh, products you need, for example, a real-time clock. So, uh, and while putting this presentation together, I did some snooping on, on Jason's website. And I, I, boy, I found a lot of stuff that I've missed. He's been really busy on the website in the background. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and do some snooping yourself. It's very interesting stuff. So I am to the demo portion of, the, of my presentation. I'm going to be uh, uh, showing you the GUI of the of HamPi. Not HamPi, but uh, Build-A-Pi. I'm going to show you where the uh, bat 
uh, PAT menu, the interface on that. RDOP is an HF modem that is used by WinLink and PAT WinLink. Direwolf is a, uh, again, is a, a modem or TNC for the packet portion of, uh, of uh, WinLink. And I'm going to send it, send a packet email. And um, I forgot to get one together. Anyway, so and I'm going to talk a little bit more about FL Digi. In FL Digi, here's a called a NBEMS, which is a narrow band emergency serving messaging software. And uh, it's a group of applications that's used with FL Digi to send forms to different agencies that require them, for example, Red Cross. Etc. A lot of the uh, emergency uh, agencies and everything else are government related. And if you have any experience, government government loves forms. But uh, anyway, the, the forms come up. You know, fill them out. You send them, and the it's pretty slick because they don't send the form. They send just the information in the in the header of the packet. Tells you what form they're using. So it's it's, it's kind of slick. Uh, and I'm going to talk about AFM Messenger uh, a bit. Anything. So let me see. Then we're going to talk about JS8 call and WGS uh, TX uh, for FT8 and grid factor. Uh, during the presentation, uh, we ran into a few issues. Uh, the basic issue, I just ran out of time. Uh, the other issue was the uh, Pi needed a reboot, whereas the Pi is usually a pretty reliable little computer, like all other computers, sometimes it needs a little bit of attention. So I didn't get to the good stuff, so we decided to uh, put a little add-on, see if we can splice it into the presentation to give you a overview of the some of the modes for build a Pi. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay, Pat Winlink. Um, Pat Winlink is the Winlink's version uh, used by the Raspberry Pi uh, to send and receive emails. And also, you can also use it to request that certain uh, types of information be sent to you, and like uh, news or weather reports, propagation reports, etc. So you can request it for that from the Pat catalog. But uh, anyway, this is a menu put together by um, Jason. He's put a lot of work into this. He's written scripts and to pull a lot of different uh, software together, uh, configured them to run, to make it run as easily as possible. He's done a very good job. Uh, so uh, go through a very brief overview of this um, uh, menu. This menu is deceptive because there's layers upon layers. Uh, there's all kinds of information. There's tools in here. There's uh, maps. There's uh, uh, lists of uh, RMS stations, etc., so to bring it all together to work. So we won't be going to everything on it. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go through RDOP. RDOP is an HF modem. Uh, it's used, required when we use HF. Uh, packet modem, we use a third-party uh, software called Direwolf and Kiss Attach, which has to be integrated to work. Uh, we have... Uh, um, Pat Auto Connect. Uh, if you don't know your RMS station, uh, you can bring this up and feed it some uh, um, some uh, kind of criteria, and it'll go out and see if it can find an RMS station for you. Connect to. We're going to be using Pat Catalog in this demonstration, so I'll bring that up right real quick. Again, you can uh, request different information: weather report, participant report, propagation, and news reports. Now let's bring up a news. Okay, so what kind of news? We've got daily news. Hey, how about U.S. news? And so when I continue this, it's gonna, this is going to put it to the outbox of the email client that we're going to be using. And so the next time we are con uh, connect to the WinLink system, it will put that onto the Internet to be sent back down to us down the line the next time we, we uh, <coughs> connect. Excuse me. So uh, let me bring this here to see if we show you what's going on. Okay, over here in Conky, down here in Radio Tools, you'll see some uh, uh, Radio Tools and digital applications. 
We have Pat running in the background right now, and we're going to be sending a packet uh, uh, email requ request. So we're going to need Dire Wolf to come up and Kiss Attack to come up, and this will do automatically when I connect by the packet modem. So it's standing by. If you look over here, you see Dire Wolf came up. Uh, Kiss Attack will come up here in a second. Here we go. So hey. He said, it's up and going. That opens up our email client. So if we look into our outbox here, we ha should have a message waiting there. It's a query uh, to email. So we're going to go to action. We're going to go connect. And we're going to use an alias. Again, this is just aliases are just some save stations that I've used before, like HF, uh, uh, 20 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters, whatever. But it also has a uh, UHF station in there. Uh, excuse me, VHS station, uh, KE0GB-10. And that's Rick down in the Colorado Springs. So we're going to be using his station for this packet request. And we come down here to connect. This is dialogue right here that uh, is, that's taking place. We're connected to him. Uh, we're connected to the CMRS, which is the uh, you know, the main internet. We're connected to the internet, what this is saying. And he's doing checking, doing a checksum on the message we're sending, and they're transmitting it at this time. And now we're just connected. Okay, so that message has been sent. There was a request that we have sent to him. So we're just going to give this just a minute. Let me go back up to our connect. And I'm going to cheat this time because uh, for time restraint to the uh, for the uh, presentation, and I'm going to use alias again, but this time I am going to use the internet. So I'm going back to uh, to uh, WinLink. Um, and they in turn, you see, our message just came back. They sent it back to me. And it should be in our inbox. We check our inbox. This is the news that we requested. So it takes about uh, 15 seconds or so, maybe 20 seconds, uh, depending on the length of the message to receive this by radio. So, but we cheated. But anyway, so this is a, a um, a brief demonstration, an overview of using. Uh, when linked to an email again hf takes a bit longer it takes up to now well, you can go to five to eight minutes depending on the band conditions and things of that nature so uh, it takes a bit longer to uh to uh, send a message but it does work sometimes you have to have some patience to get it to work and everything but uh again emergency communications out in the field uh Next uh, thing I think I'll be talking about is uh, FL Digi. So, uh, uh, Lauren gave you a, a brief overview of FL Digi. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Uh, normally, when you're using FL Digi, it's keyboard to keyboard. You have two operators exchanging information back and forth between each other. There are there is a bunch of programs uh, indicated by these icons here that is used with FL Digi in a different form, and it's called Narrow Band Emergency Messaging System. And basically, it's what it, it what it is is a uh, a message is sent by forms. Uh, different agencies uh, have different forms. You have agencies. Uh, you have the Red Cross, you have the uh, Mars stations, you have uh, civil air patrolman stations. Uh, you can get weather, things of that nature, sent back and forth. Uh, they, the advantage to this is you don't have to have an operator at the other end waiting for something for you to be sent. They, this, these forms are placed into a folder on his computer, and he can look at it as, at his convenience. So, okay, Barry, now you're talking about forms. Boring. The reason I'm bringing this up is there's no reason that you can't use FL Digi on UHF, VHF, digital simplex frequencies. That makes it local. So you can be talking to one ham or to another. Uh, 
uh, during emergency situations. It's, it's basically like an email. So, you know, that you have that capability to, uh, available to you during uh, an emergency situation. Uh, now, uh, they can press on with uh, uh, JSA call be next here. Okay, a quick overview of um, JS8 Call. Uh, JS8 Call is a really interesting program as it has the uh, weak signal decoding of FT8. It has the keyboard functionality of uh, FL Digi. It has the uh, uh, Digipeter and message forwarding of the old uh, BBS. But uh, bulletin board system of uh, packet radio of old. You can send emails with it. It ties into APRS where you can send uh, position reports and messaging. So a very useful program. So a quick overview. Uh, frequency on the left-hand corner. Uh, note, you know, it's just um, one frequency uh, per band. But if you note down at the bottom, we have two meter. Uh, that means we can use this program locally for nets and for uh, communications between uh, club members. Uh, moving on with the overview, in the upper right-hand corner, you have on toggle on and off switches for receive, transmit. You can spot it to a PSK reporter. Uh, there, you have some other uh, other functions here in the this blue area where you can set your speed and, and enable certain things in certain settings. Basic uh, basic GUI is on the left-hand side is band activity, and the middle uh, portion is uh, communications just happening um, back and forth between uh, the users. On the right-hand side is uh, uh, HAMS online. This you will see there's different symbols in front of the, some of the uh, um, call signs. Uh, star means uh, I can hear them and they can hear me. So uh, you, you, this is used as a heartbeat system, which is a uh, you can send out a uh, heartbeat out to say, hey, I'm on air, I'm alive, and uh, after the heartbeat is sent, those people that will receive you, can hear you, will reply to you. And that's all uh, automatic. And it has a lot of canned canned things that you can send. Because I have to type it in. Uh, type it, I'll type it in, whatnot. Anyway, very, very interesting program. Fun to use. So I need to learn more about it. And I plan to do so. Uh, so here, my heartbeat just came back to me. These people have seen me and are replying. So anyway, pressing on, I'll go to the next uh, next area. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, WSJTX and FT8. Uh, WSJTX uh, has a host of uh, modes that you can use with their program. And FT8 is just one of them. Uh, when you bring up FT8, it bring, comes up in two two windows. And the top window is uh, your that's your information for your band, your band your bandwidth. You can use one frequency in FT8, uh, JS8, and it's uh, 3,000 k wide. And this is the activity on that band broken down. So. Uh, you need this information sometimes to change your transmit and receive frequencies so you don't have a strong station like this sitting on top of your receive stations and interfering with your contacts. So the uh, main, your, the purpose of your FT8 is uh, what it is. You're making a digital contact with another digital station. You're exchanging uh, signal reports. That's it. It doesn't sound like much. It doesn't sound like any, any kind of fun, uh, but it is. It, it gets, it's very addictive, okay, especially if you use it with another program. Uh, but basic uh, GUI on this one, uh, left-hand side is, um, is band activity. Uh, right-hand side would be a, the uh, uh, dialogue between stations is changing in, in process of contacting and changing signal reports. 
Uh, you have a uh, uh, section down here. If you click on a station, it's going to give you the azimuth to that station and how far that station is away from you. Uh, the dialog is is right here. You're going to um, identify him as a station. He's going to come back to you, give you a signal report. You're going to give him a signal report. You're going to go say, "Hey, we're happy," and that's the end of it. Uh, then you can log, you can log that into your logbook. So a, a quick demonstration. I'm going to pick a, a station here that's uh, kind of in the weeds that I don't expect any contact with. Uh, because I don't want to talk to him during this presentation. So anyway, radio is transmitting at this time. I'm calling him, okay? And I usually run this about three or four times before I give up and go to another different station. So basically, that is uh, uh, what you're doing with uh, FT8. doesn't look like much, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, it gets very addictive, especially if you start collecting states and countries and things of that nature. So I'm going to stop transmitting here, and we'll press on uh, to uh, Red Tracker, which I use um, in conjunction with this program. When I'm playing with uh, FT8 and I have the internet available, I like to use a companion. Uh, program called Grid Tracker along with it. It uh, makes it uh, a lot more fun to, to play FT8. So basically it gives you an interactive uh, map. Uh, there's several different maps you can choose from. There's like uh, probably 15 or 20 maps. I like this map because uh, it will show weather. It will show your lightning strikes and things, and lightning storms and things of that nature. If there's a storm in the area, we even have a lightning detector uh, here. And when that's uh, initialized, it'll give you your re reports. Uh, lightning strike detected 30 miles away, 15 miles away, 10 miles away, one mile away. So depends on how brave you are before you shut everything down. So, uh, But uh, right now with FT8, I'm collecting states. Um, and uh, these, this, these maps have a whole bunch of different overlays that you can uh, put with them. So, for example, uh, for maps, I'm uh, bringing up maps. I'm on 15 meters right now uh, because uh, it is open. It's very seldom open. I haven't, haven't seen it open as much as it is today. So uh, programs very uh, reliant on the Internet. Uh, very heavily interactive with uh, PSK Reporter. There's PSK Reporter information up here. And if I can get this to do what I want to with uh, all the little windows and stuff. Hey, PSK activity. So right now there's very little on 40 meters and some on 20 meters. But, you know, 17 and 15 meters today is popping. So it's just, uh, so I'm, playing some uh, 15 meters while we're talking here. So I'm not, uh, it's just frustrating. Okay. So anyway, so I'm going to bring this, uh, this is called a call roster. This is the same information displayed in the band activity on FT8. And it gives you a little bit more information. It'll show you your um, uh, different, different countries, different continents. Uh, the stuff in the white here and everything else. So that is the uh, uh, states that I have not worked. So if I initiate a transmission on on that, it'll bring this window up. And just, uh, I'm trying to contact him. I've worked him before. I've worked him on, it looks like 20 meters, but I can't, can't see real good unless I get closer to the screen. So that gives us some information. He's an extra. Uh, give us his name, we'll grow, uh, where, is he, where he is at. He's in New Hampshire uh, and gives you a link to uh, J, uh, QRZ, uh, com. Uh, anyway, I am contacting him here. I don't need to see this information. And I'm looking at a map here. And when I transmit, you'll see my, tra my station trans transmitting to his station. If this line turns solid, that means we have established communications with each other and the exchange is starting to take place. Uh, all kinds of information you can gather from this program. This is my, my antenna radiation pattern. 
uh, East Coast is is up and going. There's not much going on the West Coast, so just uh, uh, that's why you can I can come up to the little dot on the end, click right, and I can get a signal report. And that's uh, minus 15 right there, I think. Yeah, I'm not too close to the computer. Anyway, I can take that off. But there's so much information here that's available to um, for you to look at. Uh, it makes it a lot more fun to play uh, with the JS8 and let you see what's going on. This thing is just chuck full of uh, statistics uh, uh, that you can look at. You can uh, see what the, your longest uh, it tracks everything. It tracks your uh, the longest um, distance you've gone, the shortest distance you've gone, what states you've worked, what countries you've worked, what awards you you got, things of that nature. So a lot of good information in here. I can talk about this program for hours. Don't have the time to do so. So I'm going to uh, end this presentation here, and I'm going to start playing some <laughs> uh, JS8 on 15 meters. Uh, just some general comments before I close. Uh, build a Pi has a lot of software in it, a lot of programs. Uh, some of these programs are kind of... Um, entailed and you know, there's a learning curve behind them but there's a ton of information on the youtube and the uh websites that from the programs themselves they have forums uh things of that nature to, ha to help you along in the process so uh you know once you get your pie together you need to to use it to, to uh, use these programs and practice 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 to make you proficient in using them and in the field build a pie just works if you if you take the time to learn what's going on with them uh the <clears throat> other thing i would suggest is to is back up back up back up all right uh, build a pie has a or the raspbian has a uh, backup program in it uh buy a sd card reader excuse me <clears throat> uh that you can use with the pie Cost seven dollars and plus uh, use another SD card. You'll be putting a lot of time and effort getting your Pi together the way you want it to run. And if you lose it, you'll be kind of you won't be a happy camper. Um, I've corrupted two uh, SD cards. Both the SD cards were corrupted by heat. Uh, not really the Pi's fault. Uh, uh, one example for, as it was uh, it was in a car. Not in the sunlight, but uh, windows closed, 2,000 degrees in the car, and the uh, uh, the SD card went tilt. But a uh, reformat and a reinstall of uh, the Pi build on it uh, has been running fine ever since. So uh, you can lose, you can corrupt a card. So a backup is always good to have. Uh, anyway, just a uh, uh, I've been having a blast with my the Pi out in the field running different things. And just remember when you're running this this build is for end field use, emergency communications, no internet, no phone. Uh, you just uh, and you can uh, put out emails and other types of uh, uh, communications in a, in a uh, emergency type of situation. So anyway, have fun. Build, get involved and build one of these and you, you won't be regret it so I'll, that's uh, the end of my presentation I wish you the best 73s if I can get this thing to stop alright um, so just kind of some final observations and then some more reference material here before we open it up uh, I think what the next uh, slides, I'm not going to go over, but it's a list of all of the applications uh, that uh, that are available, and it shows a comparison of what's on HamPy and what's on Build-A-Pi. HamPy has a greater variety of applications, and it is definitely easier to get started, but no options. You get what you get. Um, now, if you really want to go in and uninstall, you could certainly do that, but um, but that would take some work. There is some bloatware in there. There's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, you probably don't need. And there's one other kind of interesting aspect in the HamPy that got built into it. I'm not sure if you're anyone of you are familiar with Boink. 
but it is a crowd-sourced or crowd-sharing of idle time on processors to do computations. And the, um, um, uh, the guy who had created HamPy decided that he was going to put that in, and if uh, Raspberry Pis are running and uh, they're not being used, there's some uh, processor uh, time available in the background, he's going to contribute to, uh, to that. I don't particularly have a problem with it because I do that ordinarily on uh, some of my uh, computers that are on and running quite a bit, but you don't have a choice. You don't get a, to opt out. As uh, Barry was showing, the build a Pi is, I think, more tailorable to your needs, and it is clearly better suited to uh, portable operations. Uh, we mentioned earlier the integration of, uh, of these applications uh, to get them working together. Um, you're, you're on your own, and uh, HamPy has very, very little support online. Um, you have to go searching on how to make the applications work. Whereas Jason uh, with the build a pie, he goes into in depth how you, how you set those up. And um, I think that's a, a real positive thing. I did a comparison of applications and I'm just gonna scroll through here and show you just how many they are. I'm not gonna talk about it, but when we publish the uh, presentation, uh, you'll get a chance to go in and look at it. But there is a lot. So with that, I think we're pretty much have used up our time and thanks for everybody for listening. And um, um, I think we can open it up to any questions. I did, um, I, I saw a couple of in the chat and there was a question about what, uh, what Raspberry Pi might, uh, might be uh, best to get. I'd recommend a, a 4B. Uh, it's got four core processors. It's way more capable, way more RAM. And I think if you're you're using these, you you could use the horsepower if it's uh, if you're especially if you're doing an SDR uh, or some of the digital modes. Um, another a comment uh, that Stephen pointed out was that these will run hot. I didn't uh, point it out when I showed you the picture of um, of my uh, setup, but I I have a fan running on mine and um, it helps a, it helps a great deal. So opening it up, uh, if anybody's got any questions, uh, shoot. One of the things I was observing, I just put that in the chat, with the Raspberry Pi 4, there are three different memory sizes that you can get. I would spend the couple extra dollars and go for the highest amount of RAM. That will also help you. Also, one of the things I do is I tend to run it when I'm at my home station, not out in the field. Um, I tend to have larger machines on my desktop. And so I'll run your Cubic SDR instead of running on the Pi. I run it on my desktop and use Hamlib to forward the radio controls and signals um, over to the desktop. And so now my Pi is still running, but it's no longer doing the graphic waterfall presentation and things like this, which reduces the Pi's workload. And so that's a, that's a fun way to run it. Makes it very easy. You're still running uh, a full click control radio with the pan adapter and everything. Good point. Okay. So there you are. <laughs> I think um, I think it's just been good fun uh, to play to learn. It's been an opportunity for me. I am not a uh, I'm not a programmer. I'm not a uh, a Linux guy, but uh, it hasn't been bad uh, to work with at all. And um, like I said, there's just there's a, an awful lot of online help. Um, very popular and uh, just gives you options. Um, a lot of options. I want to say something about uh, Linux and the, and the Pi. These builds and everything else, you, 
You don't need to learn a lot of Linux. You will learn some Linux. You don't have to get so detailed into it. And you'll pick it up as you go. And it's just uh, so you're, you're not into the command, into the terminal all the time typing code. So it's just uh, it, uh, it's not as difficult as it works. And I do have, uh, I do have the uh, FT8 up and running if you want, anybody wants to look at it. I'm going to uh, say that uh, people are welcome to hang around, but um, I think uh, as far as the formal presentation, that pretty much uh, wraps things up and uh, nobody, no hard feelings if it, uh, you need to go. So uh, thanks everybody for your attention and uh, um, go out and have some fun. Yeah, thank you as well. And Lauren, I, there's some things that, that I've saw tonight from your presentation that I'm interested in looking at. So. I'll be playing with ham pie. <laughs>